are exciting and historic times for the Colorado River. November 19, 2012. Speaking at Glen Canyon Dam in northern Arizona, then Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar set the stage for a grand experiment years in the making. We will be marking an era in which America realizes that the goals of water delivery, water storage, and hydropower production are compatible with and supportive of management and protection of the Grand Canyon. And we will witness the awesome power of this river. With the pull of a lever, Salazar released a torrent of water from giant pipes near the base of the dam. The water will increase until a maximum release of approximately 42,300 cubic feet per second is reached. That's more than four times faster than the river was running just days before this high flow experiment began. Rushing and roaring out of Lake Powell, the water crashed into the river channel on its way to and through Grand Canyon. We didn't always recognize that these high flow events, these pulse flows, were beneficial to the river environment downstream. That was one of the breakthroughs of the 1980s and 1990s, was that recognition. The high flow was intended to take advantage of recent storms that washed sediment from tributaries into the main stem Colorado River miles below the dam. The goal is to flush that sediment downriver into the Grand Canyon to restore beaches for camping and habitat for wildlife. We will send 500,000 metric tons of sediment downstream, enough sediment to fill a football field 230 feet deep. Sediment distribution wasn't an issue here before the mid-1960s. That's when Glen Canyon Dam started storing water and producing power for growing western states like Arizona. And it's created a huge recreation economy around Lake Powell, the Lee's Ferry Fishery, and the areas around the lake and the dam. But this dam has also unquestionably had adverse impacts. The lake traps the sediment that used to course down the river, that red sediment that gave this river its name. The regulation of flows has had an impact on vegetation, on beaches, on wildlife habitat. And the colder temperature of the water has altered the aquatic ecosystem. For better and for worse, Glen Canyon Dam changed the Colorado River. Something that was not completely understood at the time was this would become a cold, clear tailwater below this high dam. Cold, clear tailwaters at the time were viewed as unique opportunities to create tailwater trout fisheries. And as a result, one of the things that, that evolved from the creation of Glen Canyon Dam was the establishment of the tailwater trout fishery that we refer to as Lee's Ferry. It's a trophy trout fishery that spans the first 16 miles of river below Glen Canyon Dam. The Game and Fish Department has managed in partnership with the Park Service and with the Bureau of Reclamation this trout fishery since its inception. Now our interests in terms of the operation of the river have a lot to do with certainly the, the recreational draw that a tailwater trout fishery provides, but also the fish and wildlife habitat associated with the Colorado River in Glen Canyon and farther downstream in Grand Canyon. Arizona Game and Fish is especially interested in habitat about 62 river miles below Lee's Ferry. As you see the little Colorado River entering into the main stem, just downstream of here uh, is, is the largest aggregation of humpback chub in Grand Canyon. The humpback chub is an endangered native fish. It was on the federal government's very first list of endangered species back in 1967. It needed that protection after Glen Canyon Dam reset the thermostat on the Colorado River. The cold, clear water that courses through Glen Canyon Dam from the depths of Lake Powell is great for trout, but not so great for native fish like the humpback chub. You can really tell the size of the hump on this. It prefers warmer waters that existed before the dam when the Colorado River flowed freely. These native fish that adapted to warm water temperatures uh, now are living in a in an area, at least in the main stem Colorado River, where it's much cooler than they're used to. And that can affect their growth, their reproduction, um, and just the ability for them to live. 
monsters. Arizona Game and Fish, in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, has been closely monitoring the status of the species since 1987. Using large hoop nets placed in the Little Colorado River not far from the confluence, researchers capture native fish, tag them with a microchip for future identification, and record their individual characteristics. We can go back to our fish database and we're able to know the last time it's been caught and then also where it's moved from. If we see that the population is in severe decline, then we may need to take management actions to, to find ways to increase the population overall. But the welfare of native fish and the conservation of sediment didn't get much consideration in the early days of operating Glen Canyon Dam. Back then, the Bureau of Reclamation ran the dam to maximize power production and optimize water delivery. As a result, flows fluctuated wildly, up and down like a roller coaster, and the river ecosystem held on for the ride. And river scientists recognized that in order to maintain the ecosystem, we have to reestablish some of the natural processes in the river. In 1992, Congress passed the Grand Canyon Protection Act, directing the Bureau to operate the dam in a manner that protects the Grand Canyon environment. Ever since then, scientists have been searching for the best way to achieve that goal. They implemented and analyzed various flow regimes, including three high flow events that took place in 1996, 2004, and 2008. We've learned a lot from those events. We've learned what conditions we need to have to make them beneficial, how long to do them, when to do them. That scientific knowledge is the basis of the new experimental high flow protocol that started with the 2012 high flow event and continues through the year 2020. It's a recipe for routine high flows whenever sediment conditions are ripe. And so we now have the ability to react when there are rainstorms and monsoons that bring that sediment into the main stem of the river. You know, sometimes if you just leave Mother Nature alone, she takes care of herself. And I think that, you know, through all of this manipulation and experimentation, that they can literally create more chaos than anything else, my personal opinion. Terry Gunn's opinion is formed by 30 years as a fishing guide on the Colorado River. Owner of the Lee's Ferry Anglers Guide Service since 1988, he says high flow events are bad for business. Oh, it's not good for business. Absolutely no. I mean, it's, it's terrible for business. They, Gunn they, says one, people one get the wrong places. idea that high flows decimate the fishery. Every time they conduct one of these flows, I get emails, I get letters, we get phone calls. Sorry they're destroying your fishery again. I mean, when are they going to stop experimenting with this fishery? He takes issue with the latest experimental protocol that started with a high flow in November. And there is nothing natural about a flood event here in the wintertime. I mean, Gunn says springtime floods no make more sense. But he also says high flow events are rarely good for Lee's Ferry because so little sediment enters that first 16 miles of river below the dam. I think that at some point in time that it might, they might realize this whole theory is, is flawed. I mean, every time that they've done one of these experimental flows, there have been environmental impacts that we've seen here to the trout fishery and to uh, the, the, uh, the resource here at Lee's Ferry. You know, the sand is disappearing, the gravel bars are disappearing, and they're being sent down river. I got a fish. On the other hand, fishing at Lee's Ferry is really good. According to Game and Fish data, the catch rate for 2012 was almost two fish an hour. That's the highest average since the late 90s, and it's been trending upward since 2008. There was a high flow event that year, and research suggests it produced good results for trout. So there's some really strong data at Lee's Ferry, which is just below Glen Canyon Dam, that suggests that the 2008 spring flood event uh, triggered a, um, an increase in abundance of midges and black flies. Game and fish biologist Aaron Bunch says scientists believe the 2008 high flow cleared muck and algae from gravel on the river bottom, improving habitat for the production of both insects and trout. It was the largest number of trout on record to date in 2008. 
you know, it was one of those things, was it really the flow or was it just the timing? Uh, you know, uh, it, it was really hard to say. That, that was the year that they, they ran a springtime flow. I think that the fish thought it was a spring freshet and it was time to spawn. Yeah, I mean, we had a, a, a really super prolific spawn, but that year we needed a prolific spawn. The fish knew that too. Whatever the reason, the trout population soared in 2008, resulting in more fish competing for food with the endangered humpback chub. Another humpback chub? One of the big looming questions out there is really, what contribution does the rainbow trout population, how, how are they impacting humpback chub populations overall? For years, scientists have been concerned about non-native trout preying on young native fish like the humpback chub. The good news is that as of 2013, the populations of both species are on the rise. The current humpback chub population is higher than it's been any time in decades. And, and the trout population, the rainbow trout population, both in uh, Glen Canyon and Marble Canyon, is also high. So that, that kind of tells me that the trout really isn't having much of an influence on the humpback chub uh, and their population. As a fisheries biologist, there's always a balancing act between um, creating recreational fisheries for sportsmen and maintaining and conserving important native fish populations. And that's probably the absolute hardest job that we have. So right now, the current situation is, is ideal because we have good fishing and really good native fish populations. Only time will tell if that goes out of balance. Balancing the flows from Glen Canyon Dam to please every interest, fishing and recreation, wildlife and habitat, water and energy is a tremendous challenge. It's been said that a rising tide lifts all boats, but that's not necessarily true when it comes to the Colorado River. And until scientists figure out how to better mimic Mother Nature, the river community may just have to go with the flow, however tranquil or turbulent it may be.